Contracts are a pretty regular part of our society. The, the writing and signing of contracts is an occurrence that, that takes place all the time in our country and in other parts of the world. A contract, an agreement, a deal, a covenant, even whatever you want to call it, it all boils down to one simple concept. I'll do something for you if you do something for me. You'll get something from me if I get something from you. It's bi-directional. Two parties are involved. And, and you see this, you see these contracts taking place. They're things that are signed, and you really see it in the world of sports, don't you? These big-time sports agents, they try to get a contract for their athletes, trying to establish an agreement. So, so that basically what the athlete says is, I'm going to give you, this, this team, I'm going to give you my talents and my abilities, I'm going to play for you and for you alone for the next 10 years. And in exchange, what you're going to give me is $26 million a year for those 10 years. That's the contract. That's the agreement. I get something from you if you get something from me. And those are the sports contracts. Those are the ones that everybody hears about, right? Those are the ones that call press conferences and the reporters are there and the camera flashbulbs are going off. Those are the ones you see on the news, the ones you read about in the papers. Those are the ones that are big and exciting. But there are other contracts that happen in other parts of the world. And for a long time, and maybe it's still this, sort of the case today, the, the cell phone industry used to have a lot of contracts. You would sign a contract with your cell phone provider. And again, it would go something like this. What I'll give to you is $50 a month for the next two years. But in exchange, you have to give me reliable cell service and maybe a, a free cell phone. Now, to this day, I've never had reporters there when I signed a contract with my cell phone company, and I can't understand why. Those are some pretty rich contracts. But you see these things. There are many other examples. Things like this happen all the time. Whatever it is, whether you're getting a new job or you're buying a house or you're getting a kid to come over and take care of your lawn, the contract is in place, an agreement, a deal, a covenant. I'll do something for you if you do something for me. And both parties agree to it. And this agreement stays for an extended period of time. But as soon as one side fails to do what they said they were going to do, the whole contract goes away. As soon as one party doesn't uphold their end of the bargain, then the contract is null and void. If I were to stop paying my cell phone company $50 a month, they would stop providing me with cell service. This is the way contracts work. You see them all the time in our society, and really they have been around for a very long time. Contracts, deals, covenants, they've always really been there. And that's really a good way to describe the relationship that existed between God and his people. It was a covenant, it was a contract, it was a deal. In our text today from the prophet Jeremiah, we hear about a new contract, something different. And this is what, what God says to Jeremiah. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. For centuries, a contract was in place, a covenant between God and his people. And now Jeremiah is talking about something new, a new deal. But in order to understand that new deal, we have to understand the old one. We have to figure out what that's all about. In order to do that, we've got to go back in time a little ways. Back to the time when the people had just left the land of Egypt. They just left the kingdom that held them in slavery for over 400 years. And when they left, they did so by the power of God's mighty hand. And God put that power on display when he sent ten plagues that completely devastated the Egyptians but left the Israelites untouched. And that power continued as he brought them out of Egypt and allowed them to cross the Red Sea on a path of dry ground and then use that same Red Sea to swallow up the Egyptian army that tried to pursue them. And God continued to display his power as he led them into the wilderness and then fed them with food from heaven, gave them water from a rock. And all of these things were leading up to Mount Sinai. There on Mount Sinai, the leader of the people, Moses, he went up and he spoke with God. And he brought down to the people 
an agreement, a covenant, a contract, ten laws that they were to follow, ten commandments that were going to govern their way of life and govern the way that they would show love to God and love to each other. This was the deal. Now the deal was, if you do this for me, God is saying, then you'll get something from me. And what God would give to them was peace and prosperity and wealth and security in the promised land that he was just going to give to them. Allow them to go in and conquer and take it. That's the deal. Again, pretty straightforward. And the deal had some caveats because if the people fail to uphold their end of the bargain, then they wouldn't get the land. And they would become like every other nation that would be conquered by somebody at some point. And that's the way that the contract remained for a thousand years leading up to the time of Jeremiah. And for those thousands of years... The two parties agreed to this deal. The people giving to God their obedience and their trust, God giving to them the promised land. But as I said before, a contract becomes null and void when one side doesn't uphold their end of the deal. And that's what happened. One party failed to do what they said they were going to do. And you can probably guess that party was not God. God is faithful. God does what he says he's going to do. God keeps his promises. God never once faltered in giving to them the promised land, even though the people failed to do what they said they would do. And what's pretty remarkable is that they failed in keeping their end of the deal almost immediately after the deal was made. Moses brought to the people the Ten Commandments, said, do these things. And we have a contract. The deal is in place. And then he went back up onto the mountain in order to get further instructions from God. And before he could come down the second time, the people broke one of the commandments. They broke the first commandment. And they made for themselves an idol out of gold. And they worshipped that as God. And right then and there, the contract should have been null and void. God should have said, you didn't do what you said you were going to do. I don't need to do what I say I'm going to do. And the people and God, they really should have just parted ways. God should have left them in the desert to fend for themselves, just to do what they were going to do and and move on. But God is gracious. God is compassionate. And even though the people didn't say what they were, the people didn't do what they said they were going to do, God gave them another chance. And for the next thousand years, he would continue to give them more chances. Leading up to the time of Jeremiah, God continued to provide for them, even though they they faltered, even though they failed, even though they, they wandered from him, even though they didn't keep up their end of the deal. God still gave them the promised land. He still allowed them to conquer their enemies. He still made them into a great nation. He gave them peace and prosperity and wealth. He gave all that to them. And when they faltered, God would lead them back, sometimes gently, sometimes not so gently. And God continued to do this up to the time of Jeremiah, when Jeremiah came onto the scene to deliver some bad news. As patient as God had been with the people, his patience was running out. After giving them so many chances to uphold their side of the deal, those chances were gone. The people had turned their backs on God. They had disobeyed him. They failed to uphold the Sinaitic covenant. And they turned to do their own things. They turned to indulge in their own wickedness, their own sin. And so now God promised to them, through the prophet Jeremiah, that he would send the Babylonians, the enemy nation, to come down and and conquer them, to, to destroy their cities and to take their people off into captivity. Time was up for them. Now, when you see God's action in this, it really is amazing. When you see how many chances God gave to them, how for centuries God was patient with them. That's a pretty amazing thing. Like I said, the deal should have been null and void right there in the wilderness, right there at the foot of Mount Sinai. But God loved his people. That love, that compassion is amazing. And it's no less amazing in our lives. Because in many ways, the deal is still in place for us. The Ten Commandments that God gave to the people to govern their lives 
those are still there for us. We live underneath this law. It still governs the way that we live. Really, the deal should be we follow God's laws and God gives us what we need to live and to survive. God keeps us close to himself. That's the covenant. That's the contract. That is the deal. But we could never once, not even for a moment, find any comfort or peace in this deal that we would have with God. Because we know that we have broken his covenant a hundred times a day. We know that we have checked off every single commandment. Sin, 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 sin. We've, we've broken it all. And the way that we have used our words to show hatred toward others, to, to gossip about them, to slander them, to, to tear them down in front of other people. Those words that come from a mind that's filled with envy or lust or anger. And where our words are silent, where our mouths are silent, our hands do the talking, and, and we steal, we, we hurt. Those are the things that we do against God and against each other. And so if we would expect to receive anything from him, that contract is null and void. God cannot say to us, here you go, you deserve this, because we don't. God demands and he expects perfection. And where there is no perfection, God demands justice. What we deserve is justice. So we have to look elsewhere for comfort. Thankfully, God provides it. Because the old agreement, the old covenant, the old contract never really could provide us any comfort. We can never look to that, never look to the laws and say, because of this deal with God, I'll be okay. Everything will be fine. It's never going to happen. And God knows it's never going to happen. Remember how amazing God's grace is in our lives? Well, that grace comes to us in a different way, through a new covenant, a new deal, a new contract. And God makes a promise to us that the old deal is going to be replaced by something new. It's a new deal that cannot be messed up by us because we really have no part in it other than to receive the benefit of it. God is faithful. God has made a promise to us and God will keep that promise. He does all the work. This is what he said to the people of Israel it, while they were on the verge of being destroyed by, by their enemies. God said this to them. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. It's not going to be like that. No more two-sided agreement. Instead, God says, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. And that's it. That's the deal. And it's a pretty sweet new deal because God does all the work. No longer does God expect us to uphold our end of the deal. He doesn't even give us one to uphold. He doesn't require that we do something for him in order for us to receive something from him. He just says, I'm going to do it. Every bit of it. Everything that, that you need, everything that we need, God takes care of all of that. How is that possible? Because really, that doesn't make sense to us. There always has to be this something for something kind of deal. We can't have something for nothing. Well, Jesus comes to us and he shows us exactly how it takes place. And Jesus established that new covenant. We sat with his disciples in the upper room on Monday, Thursday, he gave to them his body and his blood, and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. And in that blood, there is the cleansing of sin. In that blood, there is forgiveness. In that blood, there is peace. Because that's the blood that was shed on the cross to pay for our sins. And it is blood that has value the necessary value because it is precious and holy and innocent. Jesus came to establish this new covenant and he did it by living the perfect life, 
doing everything that was necessary in order to maintain this deal with the Heavenly Father, in order to keep the contract intact, Jesus did all of it. He lived the perfect life by keeping thoughts of anger or hatred or, or lust, wicked deeds out of his mind and off of his hands. He lived perfectly so that God would have to say to him, okay, I've done ev- you've done everything for me, now I will do something for you. But Jesus' message to the Father is, don't do it for me, do it for them. Because I have fulfilled this covenant, make the deal with them. And give to them the promise of eternal life. This is what happened when Jesus lived and died to remove our sin and to give us the reward that God agrees to give to all those who are perfect. Because of Jesus, in his sight, we are perfect. That's a sweet new deal, and you can see it happens only because of God. In the past, on Mount Sinai, the deal fell through but not because God failed to uphold his end of it. And so we can be sure that this new deal that God makes with us will never fall through because the only one who has to keep his end of it is God. The only one who has to do anything is our Lord, the one who has promised it. Again, the one who is faithful. The one who always does what he says he's going to do. That's the new deal that we get to hold on to. Our contribution is nil. Thank God for that. Because our contribution could never be enough. We would never be able to keep the contract intact by doing what we say we're going to do because we'll always fail. That's the blessing of God's grace. He never fails. He says he will forgive our sins. He says he will forget them. And that's it. And so as Easter approaches, I pray that we would remember that. Easter is the exclamation point on God's new covenant, his new contract with us. But you know what? This really has been the covenant, the contract that has been in place, really from the moment that sin entered the world. When Adam and Eve sinned and brought sin into the world and brought sin to you and me, at that moment God said to them, one of their offspring would crush the serpent's head. That was the deal that God made. And you notice he required nothing from Adam and Eve. There were no conditions, no requirements from them. He said, one of your offspring will crush the serpent's head. That's it. And he sent Jesus to do that. He is the offspring. He is the one who makes it all happen. He is the one who does it. If you look again at the people of Israel, they they lost their land. They lost the land of Canaan. God gave it to them, but there were conditions attached to that. They They were no longer a powerful nation, a powerful kingdom. But because God is faithful, they never lost their salvation. Because God made a promise to redeem them from their sin, they never lost that. Because God is the one who does it all. And it is done. And we see Jesus who has accomplished this for us. We always have that promise. We always have that promise fulfilled. This is the new deal. God brings us life and salvation. Amen. Please stand. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one.